All right. So welcome. Sorry, is it working? Yeah, it is, right? It's not? It is, okay, so I'll keep it uh, close to my mouth. So for the last three days, uh, a bunch of us here have had the pleasure of doing the uh, functional programming course by uh, John Lefus. And if I speak for myself, I must say I have learned a lot. So my expectations are uh, high for this uh, meet as well, no pressure. Um, John is a prominent member of the Scala community uh, on the more functional programming uh, side of, the of, of Scala. So you can do either um, uh, object-oriented or functional or both, um, as you probably know, since you are here. Um, and he is also the maintainer of uh, Scala Z, that uh, or ZO uh, sub-module uh, of uh, Scala Z. And we have been uh, learning a lot about that the past few days. And uh, this meetup will be a bit broader than that, so it will be about uh, orthogonal functional architecture. But uh, John will uh, introduce that, I guess. So this meetup is the first time we've had such a big crowd, so thanks for coming. Um, and it's also the first time we've had such a fancy venue. Um, and that, of course, is not free. So before we get started, I'd like to give Michel the word, uh, because uh, he is uh, part of Big Data Republic, so am I. Uh, and Big Data Republic is uh, sponsoring this meetup. So Thanks, uh, Ruth-Jan. Yeah, so um, uh, we are Big Data Republic, uh, and for those of you who, uh, who don't know us, we're a data uh, consultancy company with uh, highly specialized and uh, experienced uh, data scientists and data engineers. And we work for uh, a, a large number of very interesting and uh, uh, also complex uh, Dutch uh, clients, uh, a few of which are here on this slide. Uh, and uh, um, to give you just a short impression, a few weeks ago we had another meetup uh, which was focused on the data science community, uh, uh, and that was with KLM. And to give you an impression, I want to show you the after movie. Maybe some of you have already seen it because we posted it on LinkedIn as well. Uh, but it's just uh, an interesting peek into uh, what happens at uh, our clients. Um, let me switch. Yeah, and then I have to do the Yeah, we're in the cinema. My name is Joyce Morin. I'm one of the product owners for the project MOPS. A MOPS is a system, a passenger forecasting system that we introduced last year to optimize our loadings, our meals that we take on board for every flight. Going beyond what you learn in, for instance, online courses and really describe what it actually takes to go from an idea to putting a model in production. In order to really get this idea across, we decided to present a full cycle data science project. We have people presenting from business development to data science to the engineer who tied everything together and put the model in production. And I really think that that gave a very nice perspective on, uh, on what it takes. We have a certain ambition to make KLM more data-driven. And to achieve that, we have been looking for the tools to do that, and machine learning happens to be uh, one of those tools. I think that data engineering on data science meetups is becoming more and more relevant because lots of data science models, while they are awesome, they don't get to deliver the right business value because data scientists often do not know exactly how to industrialize it, how to make it production worthy. So it's good to tell data scientists on how to take the next step with their model so we can deliver the right business value together. From a data science perspective, what it shows is that you need to really understand the data value chain well. So what is the business value that you're going to deliver? What is the action of your end user? Who is your end user? And what insight do you need to produce? And from that, with the combination of what data you have, you can basically formulate a problem that you can solve, for instance, with machine learning. And that's what we did in this project. And there, I think it's really important to keep things simple. So no deep learning when you don't need to. Go for a more straightforward method like light GPM gradient boosting decision trees and also get your stakeholders committed in the process. 
Yeah, so that's, uh, that's just a short impression uh, of what, uh, what kind of things we're doing. And before I give the word to John, uh, I have only uh, one uh, other remark, and that is that we're uh, looking for good uh, data engineers and data scientists. So we are hiring. If, you, if you're interested, uh, please uh, take a look at our website or LinkedIn, and you can also, uh, during drinks afterwards, uh, uh, talk to Dave, via recruiter, who is uh, there uh, taking care of the technical side of things uh, for now. Okay, so thanks a lot, and uh, I'll give the, the mic to John. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Big Data Republic, for helping sponsor this meetup, and the Data Engineering Meetup as well for inviting me to speak here. I never imagined I would be giving a talk in a movie theater. <laughs> this is kind of interesting. Where's the popcorn and drinks? <laughs> Tonight, I'm going to be talking about orthogonal functional architecture. And unlike a lot of my talks, unlike, unlike a lot of my talks, this one is having a lot of technical difficulties. Now, um, unlike a lot of my talks where I'm speaking to a mixed audience, in this talk specifically, I'm assuming that you are already sold on functional programming. So there will be no pitch here for functional programming. How many of you are already functional programmers? Okay, about half of you. Well, more than half, probably three quarters of you. That's awesome. The other qu quarter of you may be a little bored, but hopefully there'll be a little something in here for you accidentally. <laughs> what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is how we as functional programmers can help better factor our libraries that we build, both libraries internal to an application, so usually we'll have parts of our application that we build with the expectation that they'll be consumed by our coworkers, layers of our application. And also, as we contribute to open source projects and build libraries for consumption outside of our company, these techniques can help you write functional code that is modular and composable, that feels right. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a second. But first, I want to talk to you about why I'm a functional programmer. I'm a functional programmer because I spent many years as a non-functional programmer. And I've worked on some horrendously large code bases that were maintained by dozens, hundreds of engineers over decades. Millions of lines of code in lots of different languages, C and Java and so forth. And there's a lot of nasty stuff going on in a typical procedural code base. And uh, coming to recognize where some of these problems stem from, from took a really long time. I had to study a lot. I had to learn a lot about functional programming. Eventually, I discovered that a lot of the problems in procedural programming come from the fact that everything is ad hoc, everything is sort of made up, everything is constructed from a large number of randomly shaped pieces that you reason about non-locally, you need to reason about globally, you need to look at the entire program in order to understand truly what's happening in this tiny little section of the program. And, and that makes it really hard to change that code safely. You go into a code base like that, and you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen, so you have to start studying. And you study, uh, you see this method calls that method, which does that network I.O., which goes out there and, and does this other thing. And, and before long, you have to explore a huge amount of the code base before you can create a mental model inside your head of, of the impact that your change is going to have. And that takes a lot of time, and we make a lot of mistakes, and also we, we can't fit the whole program in our brain, so we make shortcuts. And then we end up shipping code, and it ends up blowing up at runtime or having edge cases that our customers report. And functional code, it promises us something different. It promises us a nice, neat, ordered house. Everything is modular. Everything is clean. Everything is principled. And while 
uh, functional programming doesn't entirely deliver on this promise. <laughs> I've, I've seen some very large functional code bases, and there are some problems there as well. I do think it succeeds in moving us in a better direction. It succeeds in moving us into a direction where our code base is constructed from principled constructs, not ad hoc constructs, but principled constructs that have their basis in mathematics. And where we build up more, more complex solutions to bigger and bigger problems, from a smaller number of building blocks, each one of which can be reasoned about locally. To understand a piece of a functional program, we need only look locally. We don't need to examine the entire state of the program. We can understand what it does by looking at types and restricting our, our, our studying of the code base to the region that we are modifying. And that's a tremendous benefit when going into change in application. It gives you a certain fearlessness that you can't find in procedural programming. It gives you the ability to go in, look at those types, make that change, and know something about what's going to happen after the fact. And, and that's a life changing. For someone who's worked in very, very large projects with lots of lines of code, this level of principled software development can be life changing. It can be totally transform the way you approach software development. But not all functional code is created equal. I think that there is such a thing as bad functional code. I've seen it. I still prefer to work in a bad functional code base than a good, than a good procedural code base, honestly, because I feel safer changing that bad functional code and improving it over time because the types and local reasoning and referential transparency and other benefits of functional programming but, but honestly, some functional code is better than others. It, it feels better. And it's taken me a while to figure out what it is about good functional code that makes it so pleasant to work with. And I think there are two key ingredients that go into every really great functional library and functional API out there. And I think if we study these two ingre ingredients and we look for them, in libraries, and we try to understand um, how we can make our code like them, then we can leverage these design principles in the code that we're building to, to take our mediocre functional code or, or maybe not so great functional code and bring it a few notches up, make it, make it something that's really great, something that we can, we can look at and we can be really proud of that really does play to the strengths of functional programming. And in this talk, I'm going to argue that these two ingredients are orthogonality and composability. And what I'll do is I'll talk a bit about what these things are because we hear about them a lot. Functional programmers love to talk about composability. Composable this, composable types, and composable effects, and composable this, composable that. You hear that word all the time, but what does it actually mean? And orthogonality, you hear that as well, not quite as often as composability, but you hear it, but people seldom give that a meaning that, that gives you an intuition for what's going on. It's, it's, it's hard to pin down what an orthogonal design is, but I'm going to try to do my best tonight to give you some insight into these two ingredients for what I would say is best practice functional programming and show you how we can take designs that are not orthogonal or not composable and slowly tweak them bit by bit until we arrive at something that, that feels right, where all the pieces fit together, where they go together at right angles and they snap together to allow us to build bigger solutions out of smaller pieces. In my opinion, the reason these are the two ingredients to good functional design are that Number one, composability makes our functional code powerful. It makes it able to solve big problems out of a small number of pieces. And orthogonality is what makes it beautiful. So these two things together, they combine together to make our functional code both powerful and beautiful. A and by the way, <laughs> there's multiple me meanings of the word beauty, obviously, 
there's the one meaning where you format your code so it's nice and pretty and you align all the things and so forth. And yeah, I'm a little OCD and I like that that style of pretty as well. But there's more to it than that. Honestly, I think, honestly, beauty that we can all appreciate regardless of our indentation preferences or alignment preferences is modularity and uncluttered by irrelevant details. When we look, when we look at an API, when I say this is a beautiful API, I mean it's very modular and problems are concerned by what they should be concerned with. They're not distracted by things that could have been ripped out. And so that's the definition of, of beauty I'm using here, both powerful through their composability and beautiful through their orthogonality. Composable orthogonal bases for a functional API, they're powerful, but they're also small and simple to reason about. And that's extraordinarily important in dealing with complexity in large-scale software development. Because there are lots of APIs out there that are powerful and not so composable. If you take any given Java framework, for example, that's that has uh, millions of lines of code, or any of these big data processing frameworks, which millions and millions of lines of code and hundreds of packages, they're all extraordinarily powerful. But they're not small, and they're not simple to reason about, and there's a reason for that. It's because of how they're designed. I would argue it's because they're not composable. And the orthog orthogonality permits these APIs to be flexible and to provide very modular solutions to a variety of problems. So the combination of these two things is, is what makes for really good, really solid functional API design. Let's spend a few minutes taking a look at what it means for something to be composable. So when we look at an interface like this, this is written in Java, but I'll be using code from a variety of different languages tonight. When we look at an interface like this, we can ask ourselves, is this an API that is composable? You can see it has cancel, it has is done, it has get, and another get. And it's not really obvious whether or not that's composable until we first def define what it is we mean when we say composable. So I want to give you a definition. Composability measures the extent to which values can be combined with other values to produce like values. Composability is a measure of combinability. If we can take two things that are similar and we can combine them into another thing that's similar, similar enough to be combined again using that same operation, then that thing is composable. And the reason why that's so incredibly important is that if you want to build an API that can permit solutions to a huge number of problems, then you either have to have a massive surface area that allows you to address those huge number of problems, or you have to have a small number of building blocks that can fit together and that you can put other building blocks on top of. And you can explore the entire space of problems using a small number of solution-oriented building blocks. That's what composability gives you, the ability to snap two things together and get something that's similar enough that you can repeat that operation indefinitely. An example of composability is, well, numbers. Inter integers are composable with respect to addition and subtraction. And the reason for that is we can take two integers and we can add them and we get another integer. And we can take that integer and we can add it again and get another integer. And we can keep on doing that as often as we want. So this gives us infinite composability for integers. There's no end to that. Composable solutions allow us to snap together solutions using building blocks to the problem that we have today. Non-composable, and that's a sign here that we are dealing with an interface, a, a, an abstraction, an API, that is non-composable. There's no way to take two futures together in, in any fashion or another and combine them together to get another future. This is a dead end. API. You use what's here. 
can't build futures from other futures using this API. This is a non-composable API. How about orthogonality? What does that mean? Well, we can look at this same future example and ask ourselves, is this orthogonal? Are the angles of these building blocks correct? Are they 90 degrees? To answer that question, we have to take a look at what the definition of orthogonality is. And what I would propose is that orthogonality measures the extent to which primitive operations on values have single unique concerns. So composability measures the extent to which we can take two values and combine them together using some operation to get another value we can combine again using that same operation. And orthogonality measures the extent to which all of our primitive operations do something totally different and unique. And I'll give you an example here. Let's use that example of addition and subtraction. If you consider those as two different operations with respect to a, a given fixed number, then addition moves you right on the number line and subtraction moves you left. And there's no way that you can get one from the other. So you can consider addition and subtraction of a number to a given fixed number to be orthogonal operations because you can't implement one in terms of the other. There's no overlap. One bumps you that direction, one bumps you in that direction. So addition and subtraction are examples of, or incrementing and, and decrementing, I should, I should probably more precisely say, are examples of operations that are orthogonal. There's a nice geometric interpretation of the word ortho orthogonal. In fact, this is where the concept of orthogonality comes from. It comes from geometry. In, in geometry, we can have coordinate systems that are described by axes. And these axes can be either at right angles to each other, as on the right, or they can be at not right angles to each other, as they are on the left. And when we have a coordinate system that's non-orthogonal, what that means is one of the axes is really a composition of two other axes which are at right angles. It's moving in two directions at once instead of one direction. Whereas when we have a coordinate system where every axis is at right angles to every other axis, every axis only moves in a singular direction. It does not move in a combination of multiple other directions. And this is the intuition behind orthogonality. You have dimensions in your API, different dimensions, and operations can move you along these different dimensions. And some operations can move you along two dimensions at once, and those operations are the ones which are non-orthogonal. They combine a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And it, it's not necessarily a problem if you have an operation that moves you along two dimensions, but it is a problem if that's a primitive operation. Those primitive operations are the ones from which you compose all other operations. A composite operation that, that happens to move you along two dimensions, that could just be a helper or convenience operation that you happen to use because it happens to be common to do two things at once. That's not a problem. The problem is when the actual primitives of your API, they bundle two different features into a single aspect of the design and don't allow you to separate them. With this definition, we can take a look at this definition of future another time and now hope to answer the question, is this orthogonal? So the answer is, yeah, it's not orthogonal. And you can see this in a couple of different ways. One of the most interesting is the getter. So the second get method, it actually combines two different things. It combines blocking and awaiting the result of the future, that is retrieving the V out of the future by blocking and waiting for its completion with a timeout. So you can imagine that if we were to refactor this design, there would be one operation responsible for timeout and another 
operation responsible for retrieving the results of the future and that those would be totally independent and, and also composable. And in this particular design, they're not. They're bundled together in a single operation that does both get and timeout. So this is an example of an API that is not orthogonal. Now, why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because it's tangling separate concerns. And whenever you tangle separate concerns in a primitive operation, that tangling is going to propagate upwards in your application. There's no way to detangle it. Once tangled, forever tangled. And because they are always tangled, cannot be separated, it infects your code base upwards, destroying modularity and forcing you to deal with two things wherever you just wanted to deal with one. So you end up having to take these tangle of concerns and propagate them up as, as high as you can. Eventually people give up and they throw away one of the concerns by making a choice on that dimension. And that limits flexibility and expressivity of the API. For this simple choice, or non-choice as the case may be, to create non-orthogonal design propagates upwards and has massive ramifications on how the API is used. What we really want is not a banana split transformer in our code base. <laughs> we want a banana transformer and an ice cream transformer and a cherry transformer so we can use them all independently. We don't want the banana split transformer because that forces us to use a banana split everywhere. And sometimes we just want a cherry. Sometimes we just want a banana. Sometimes you want to compose these th things together in some other combination that, that, that is not a banana split. And we can't do that. If all we're given is a banana split transformer, we always have to deal with banana splits. So how can we attempt to fix problems like this? <coughs> well, there's a process you can follow. And the first step involves making the system composable. And you have to make the system composable as your first step because remember, composability involves operations and operations work on values. So when you have a composable operation, it takes two values and or two or more values and gives you back a, a single value out of that that you can then combine together in the same operation. If the system is not composable, then that means two things. First off, you've, you've got major problems. You have no hope of building a good API. It will be a monolithic API. It will be a monolithic API with many different methods that address specific use cases. There are lots of APIs like that. I'll show you one in a second. Uh, but you have an even bigger problem. If your system is not composable, there's a very good chance that it's not dealing with values. It's not producing values. Uh, and if it's not producing values, then you have no hope of making the operations of that API orthogonal. Orthogonality, orthogonality is a, a secondary concern. Your primary concern is making your API composable, making it value-oriented, making a value-oriented API so you can have operations that compose values together to get other values. Once you have that, that problem solved, then you can think about whether or not the operations on values that you've created are orthogonal. But you can't even get to the second point until you have already conquered the first hill, which is making that system value-oriented and, and introducing these operations which operate on values, which give you composability. The second step is to identify the primitive operations in your API. So you've got to look through your API and figure out which ones are essential. And sometimes this is easy because some operations are implemented in terms of others. But many times people implement too many operations as primitives. That's a, that's a major problem. You've got to cut back and figure out what's the minimum set or what are the actual set of operations I need to enable me to implement all the others? The primitive operations are very, very important because all capabilities derive from them. Your entire API and what people can do with it is determined not by the composite operations, which are built in terms of the primitives, but by the primitive operations. 
the ones that can't be done in terms of the other one. So identifying those is critical. Once you identify the set of primitive operations, you need to identify the unique concerns addressed by these different operations. And sometimes you're going to find operations that address two or more concerns. And so the, the next step in the process is to refactor these primitive operations until every single one has a single unique concern. And sometimes that's not always possible for pragmatic or performance reasons, but many times it's possible to take a primitive operation that's bundling a few things and rip it apart into even more primitive operations that are just concerned with a single aspect. And that might involve changes that propagate throughout the whole API and cause you to rethink the design of, of the, the value system, the value language that you've developed. Let's work a few examples to see how this process can be applied. Back to this future example. Well, we know this future is not orthogonal. And that causes some pretty major problems. For one, it'd be really great if we could write a method called retry until success that's going to retry a future again and again and again until it succeeds at a certain spacing interval. That would be a very handy thing to have. Um, unfortunately, we can't do that because the primitive operation that we have not only times out a future, but it gets the result. So instead of writing a combinator that takes a future and retries it a bunch and gives us back a future, we have to write this retry until success, which tries the future, timing it out, and giving us back the value and not a future. And at that point, we can't compose that result with, with other futures, so we've lost composability. So this is the problem, one of many problems that you run into when you use an API like this, which is non-orthogonal and, and non-composable. So in our first step, what we're going to do is we're going to refactor this future to introduce some, well, basically detangle the get and the timeout into separate operations. So we're going to have an unsafe performed get that blocks and waits for the result of the future to be completed. And then we're going to have a separate method on this future, which times it out and gives us a new future. With this simple decision, we've introduced a certain amount of composability. We can now get a future out of this interface. This is the first method here that actually returns a future from another future. So it's an operation that allows us to get one future from another introducing some level of composability. And furthermore, we've totally separated the get from the timeout. So they become independent operations, each of which has a single purpose. The get's purpose is solely to wait until the result of the future is available. And the timeout's purpose is solely to return another future that times out after the specified time has elapsed. Let's take a look at another example. So this real life function compares two strings and it has a Boolean flag here that can be true or false. If it's true, then a null string will be considered to come first in the ordering of the two strings. And if it's false, then a null string will be considered to come after in the ordering of the two strings. Is this orthogonal? Not really. And first off, you shouldn't be using null, obviously. But that's a talk for another night. Let's ignore that fact and just try to deal with the problem of orthogonality in this real world API. This comparison function is bundling two things together. It's bundling the question of whether or not null is less with the question of which string comes first. There's a dimension here called comparison, which is the mere act of comparing two values to see which comes first. And then there's another dimension, which is, is, is null something that comes first? And this API is bundling them both together in a single method call. 
And you, you're going to see problems if you try to use an ADI like this. Remember, the tangling of these two concerns at this level will propagate upwards throughout the application, forcing us to make compromises. In this case, if we have some generic algorithm that operates on a list of string, we don't know whether or not null should be considered first. So we have to pass that in from the parent. And, and we have to propagate that information for as long as we're disciplined. And eventually, we're going to give up and make that choice because we want to stop propagating this and all the other things that we have to propagate because of the non-orthogonal API design that we're dealing with. How do we solve this problem? Well, first, you've got to design, we've got to introduce a value um, because we're going to be composing something. So we've got to introduce some unit of composition. We need something that we can provide into an operation and return from an operation. That means a value. And before, all we had was a method with primitive inputs and primitive outputs. There's nothing to compose there. So we need to introduce a value into our system that will allow us to compose things together in operations. And so we introduce an enum called ordering, which gives us a value of less than, equal, or greater. And then an interface. We can talk about these interfaces as values. And this interface is called ord A, and it provides a single operation called compare, which compares the left and right and tells us what their relative ordering is. Now we're going to define a single dimension here, which is a string order. The string ordering is just an ordinary value, and it provides an implementation of that compare function, which can tell you which of these two strings comes first. Now we define another dimension, which is the, con the concern of whether or not null comes first in any ordering. Now this dimension can be made generic. So in, in this example, I've created a null is less which extends that same interface. And what it does is you provide it with a given ordering of A, and it will return another ordering of A that uh, says null is less than any other value. So this could be viewed as uh, a decorator in object-oriented terminology. This is a decorator. Or if you were doing this in a functional language, this would be a, a function combinator. It would be a way of wrapping one function with another function and returning another function. This only deals with the concern of whether or not null is less than other values. And this one here only deals with the concern of comparing two strings. They're totally independent. And then because we've made these things values, we can now compose them together to solve solutions to our problem. The algorithm now does not need to know whether null should come before any other value. All it needs to have is this value called ORD, which compares two strings, and it can use that inside. And then from outside the algorithm, we can decide whether or not null comes first. So this greatly cleaned up our algorithm. It enabled it to focus on the concern it needed and not the concern that it didn't need to know about, which is whether or not null came first. <coughs> this is an example from Haskell. This is an MVAR, and an MVAR can be regarded as a blocking queue whose size, a two-way blocking queue whose size is limited to one. It has two different operations, put, which is going to block until the queue is empty, and then it's going to accept a value. And then it has take, which is going to take, it's going to block until the queue has something in it, and then it's going to accept that and return that single element. And if you have a bunch of putters, then they line up in a queue to put stuff into it one at a time. And if you have a bunch of takers, then they also line up an IOREF. And then what an IOREF does is give you an atomic modification operation, which handles the concern of synchronization. So lots of different threads can now update in a synchronized fashion a bit of mutable state. And then the other primitive, it's basically a write once variable. It's a write once variable. And one thread gets to write something to it, and a lot of threads can block and, and wait until that's available to be read. In, in this case, we totally detangle these two concerns. We have synchronization handled by the ref, 
can handle synchronized access to some immutable resource by synchronizing all access using the atomic modify operation. And we have the promise primitive, which handles all concurrency concerns. So this is, I apologize, it's unreadable. It's actually only a tiny, itty bitty part of Apache string utils. This is one of those gigantic APIs that I was talking about that has one method to solve every problem you've ever, well, not every problem, but the first 300 problems you've ever in encountered in string processing. Is this orthogonal? Well, I tried to create a graph of the dimensions <laughs> in, this, in this API, and I did not succeed, I'm sorry. I can't even identify dimensions. Uh, I just, I know it in my gut, this is not orthogonal. However, it turns out that there's only a small number of primitives we need to, basically though, the fundamental problem, if you look carefully at this API and you try to figure out why they have so many different methods, you'll come to the conclusion that the reason is as follows. Every single method in this API takes a string and gives you something that is a single thing that is extracted from the string. For example, you can take a string and you can split it by a character. And then you get back out of that a list of other strings. So every function, every API in this API is a, is a function that takes the string input and gives you the processed result, the parsed result of that string for some chosen predefined parser that's baked into that method. And this results in a non-composable API because there's nothing to compose together. There's just a bunch of methods that return raw values. You, you can't compose these things together. If you change that so that every function in the API is a bit different, such that it accepts the string input and eats some part of that and produces both the process output and the remainder of input, then suddenly you have a value that's composable. You can take that value, which is called a parser, and you can compose it with other parsers to yield other parsers. And you don't need a lot of primitives there to be able to parse almost any text language that you can imagine to solve almost any problem in text processing that you can imagine. You can, you can parse full-on programming languages with these primitives. And they're built on a simple notion of a function. I guarantee you, you, you wouldn't even want to try to parse languages with Apache string utils. And of course, you can define combinators to do all the things that you find in Apache string utils, like splitting lines and, and so on and so forth. You can look at an API like this, which gives you a way to build rich parsers out of simple parsers, and you can ask, well, is this one orthogonal? This one is certainly a lot more orthogonal. It's very composable, richly composable. Is this one orthogonal? Well, not quite, actually. It turns out that if this were your primitive basis, you could do a bit better. This is really, really good. But you could do a bit better than this. The operation called chain that takes one parser and a continuation for the next parser to build a parser out of those two things is actually conflating two different things. It's not obvious, but it's conflating two different things. It's conflating mapping over a parser, what's a inside a parser, with a flattening. And it's very easy to refactor that. All you have to do is change your primitive operation to be an operation called join, which takes a parser of a parser and gives you back a parser. And now this API is truly orthogonal. There's no operation that is conflation of two separate concerns. Now it turns out chain is very handy to have chain, otherwise known as bind or flat map in some programming language, is very, very common. It's a very common way to use it, but it's not a primitive operation. It's actually a composition of map and, and 
join. All right, so what have we learned? Well, I hope I've shown that functional code is good functional code is both composable and orthogonal. And it's composable so you can take small number of building blocks and combine them together infinitely, which gives you a way to explore a very large space of problems without a very large API. And it's orthogonal um, to allow you to achieve modularity and avoid tangling irrelevant concerns together in your application, infectious irrelevant concerns. Composability measures how easy it is to combine values into like values that can then be combined again. It's a measure of how value-oriented your API is. If your API is very value-oriented, if there are things in it that are values and there are operations that act on those values to give you other similar values, then it's probably very, very composable. Orthogonality, on the other hand, measures the singular focus of primitive operations. Are they concerned with one thing, just one thing, that nothing else can do any part of, or are they concerned with multiple things? And it's kind of hard to tell whether or not some primitive operations are orthogonal. But if you paid close attention to this slide, you can sometimes tell that in the number of different parameters they accept, for example. If they accept two parameters and these two parameters are unrelated, then sometimes it's a sign that that's not an orthogonal operation. And there are other design smells as well. For example, if you can find a way to factor some operation as a combination of two other ones, and each one of those is less powerful than that one, it's also a sign that something is not orthogonal. It's a sign, if you can split something up into two things, each of which is less powerful than the original, then it's, it's a sign that that operation is not orthogonal. And uh, I've shown a couple examples, very simple examples, of how you can engage in a gradual process of refactoring to orthogonality to obtain much more modular composable code that's uncluttered by irrelevant details. And that process was First, make sure your design is sufficiently composable, because if it's not sufficiently composable, you can't even consider the question of orthogonality. Once your design is composable, once you do have those operations that work on values to yield other values that can be used on the same operations, then you can ask the question, is it orthogonal? And, and that's when you, you can use the technique of identifying primitive operations, those that cannot be implemented in terms of other operations, and you can work to make sure that set of primitive operations is the right set, where every single operation in that set has a singular purpose. So thank you for watching this presentation. If uh, you've in enjoyed it, I, I highly recommend that one of the things that you do is you study good APIs out there to learn about some of this. There's some excellent APIs written in the Haskell programming language, uh, Scala programming language, PureScript programming language, in almost any programming language you can imagine, there are really, really good APIs that can teach us all a great deal about making code that's beautiful and modular. So I encourage you to do that. And uh, thank you again for coming out this late night to the movie theater to, <laughs> to, to watch a talk on functional programming. I appreciate that. Any questions? No questions? Yeah. I believe strongly that API should not be collections of things which don't compose. In other words, I would have no problem with the uh, 300 methods inside that class, if, if those methods returned something that could be composed together again into the result. For example, if every single one of those methods returned a parser, now we're in business because now we can talk about composability. Now we can talk about 
which of these operations are the primitive ones in, in terms of which all others are combined. And, and not only would that greatly increase your ability as an end user to build modular solutions on top of that, but also it would reduce the need for so many methods. Whenever you see something that's a collection of uh, 300 methods or, or 300 packages or whatever it is, you're dealing with something which is very, very not composable because composable solutions don't look like that. They yield values and they have a small number of operations which you can use to solve a great number of problems. I think that type of API is always a design smack. Um, but, uh, but that said, if it were, if it were, um, if it were done the proper way, I'd, I'd have much less of an issue with it because at least it would have a solid foundation and users would be able to build on it. As it is, there's, if it solves one of your 300 problems, one of the 300 problems that it does, then it's great. If, if it doesn't, then you can copy paste some of the for looping code inside one of these methods and make your own solution to your problem, but it's just going to be more, more code bloat and, and it, it, it's not a good design in my opinion. So the question is that in code, low-level code that's far removed from the application, we can benefit a lot from generic composable code that's orthogonal, that can work together to solve a large number of problems. But as we get further and further away from that kind of code, we get into the domain of applications, business concerns, application logic and that becomes specialized and so forth. And so the question is, to what extent can we take techniques like this and push them all the way into the application? Is there some point at which they stop working and we have to write very specialized, non-composable, non-orthogonal code? And I think the answer to that is we can go further than we have. We may not be able to go all the way in some cases, but we can go further than we have gone. And one of the ways to do that is structuring your application as essentially a compiler. A compiler where you're expressing one language, many language, in terms of another language. And so a key property for every language is that it be composable and orthogonal because it allows you to express the solution to that particular domain problem um, and express many, many solutions to all the problems in that domain in a very compact way with an orthogonal and composable basis. And that doesn't solve everything. You still got to take that mini language and you've got to express it in terms of other languages, lower level languages, and work your way down the stack until you get to the bottom. This is the onion architecture for functional programs. And it's very powerful. It, it's surprising how many sub problems in our business applications can be thought of in terms of many languages that have a small orthogonal composable basis and, and in which we can express that, translate that into other lower level languages. If we apply that technique consistently, I think we can take business applications and, and we can make them much more maintainable and much more, much e easier to update over time because many languages are good at solving tons of problems, a huge number of problems and a small number of primitives. And if you look at what people spend their time maintaining large applications to do, it's usually because they don't have that level of composability. So it's more ad hoc stuff, it's more one-off stuff. There's nothing to compose. Every solution looks totally different than any others. They're not operating in the right language for that domain. They're operating in no language at all. 
That's why they have no composability. They have no orthogonality. There's nothing to compose. Everything is one off. And honestly, I have to say that today's programming languages don't make it very easy to do that. But I think functional programming gives us some tools to enable us to build applications, functional applications, using the onion architecture. It's still, there's still some unexplored territory there and there's still some areas of boilerplate because language designers, by and large, they don't work on these big applications that we commercial programmers work on. They don't see these kinds of problems. They don't understand the day-to-day -day concerns of programming. They don't, they've never seen a 300 or you know, 3 million line of code application with all this ad hoc one-off specialized stuff in it. So they don't build languages to solve those types of problems. And that puts us in a difficult position. We have to deal with the code as it is today. We have to deal with the languages, which were not designed to solve this in a, in a better way. Um, but I think functional programming can help get us closer to the business domain using some of these techniques than we often, than we often do. Yeah. What are thoughts on orthogonality and composability when it comes to systems design such as microservices, right? So I think that in an ideal world, a perfect microservice is a function. It's just a function. All of our functions would be microservices. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's a massive amount of overhead for every microservice that goes into our system. And maybe not massive is the wrong word, it depends on what frameworks and tools you're using, but that places limits to the extent to which we can apply these techniques because if every microservice is going to be a giant bundle or somewhat giant bundle, it, it's necessarily not going to be as fine grained and we're going to have to also respect considerations about, okay, if we're gonna build truly composable microservices, that are orthogonal, each one specialized to a different purpose, um, and each one doing one thing well, then, then most likely we're, we're probably going to suffer from some undesirable runtime and deployment and maintenance characteristics. So I think as you get up to that level, primarily because the tooling is so bad, it's really, really terrible. The worse you, the higher you go up, the worse the tooling is and the more overhead and cost is associated with everything, the more types of compromises you have to make. That said, some people are working on making that problem simpler. So if you've seen the Unison programming language, they're basically trying to make it so every function is a microservice. That's not how they would describe it, but it's basically that level of, of, of being able to sort of distribute everything. Every, every function can be distributed transparently. And that can, can take these techniques to a whole new level. If, if they end up succeeding or someone else succeeds, then it can take these techniques to the level of distributed systems. Yeah. Yes. So I would recommend you study Zio. <laughs> because Zio has a lot of orthogonal API, uh, API surface area in it. Uh, for example, study schedule, the way schedule allows you to build composable retry and repetition schedules. I think that's a really good example in ABI design. Also, there's a, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what it is. It is a really am amazing API. Um, I'm going to have to look it up. It's an it's a OCaml library for doing jobs and tasks and other types of asynchronous processes. Yeah, so the question is that um, often times a system that's designed by many people, uh, distributed, and um, building an API like this requires some localization of the knowledge. So given that we're dealing with systems which were built in a distributed fashion where the knowledge was not localized, um, you see emergent designs, a and that's that's tricky. You look at these big code bases and no single person was responsible for what emerged. They're often not so much designed as undesigned. 
they came into existence out of the void by a lot of people just doing what they had to do sh to ship the code. And I do think that there are techniques you can use to refactor such designs to more composable subsystems. But the problem like this is, like without some level of education and communication and coordination, and even if you're able to incrementally move something in a good direction, everything reverts back to some state of chaos, and they don't know how to solve that problem. Yeah, what? Yeah. The question is, is it possible, do I think it's possible through static analysis to find out if an API design is truly orthogonal? And I don't think that it's currently possible to do that. I think that there's not a precise enough definition of orthogonality. And truly having that would require, I believe that it would require you be able to do analysis in some very rich fashion all the way down to the machine level or all the way down to some level in which you have some well-defined semantics. So I can't, I can't see that easily being possible in a world in which you can call any, any function which can be in the operating system or in a third party library and it can do anything. It's really, I, th I think, hard. Maybe that could be done for some subset in some well-defined mini toy, toy language in the toy environment, but I can't, I can't see it being done in general on top of all the stuff we have to deal with as, as programmers. Yeah. Yeah, so the question slash observation is, <laughs> is that the programming language is itself an API, and we're interacting with this API to build our, our programs. So it stands to reason that the programming language itself has its own set of limi limitations around composability and orthogonality. And I think it's very much true. Different programming languages have different limitations around composability and orthogonality. And and when do we when when do we know that the programming limitations themselves have become our bottleneck that we can't do better because of the programming language itself? I don't know the answer to that question. I can look at programming languages, and I, I think you can measure the composability and orthogonality of programming languages. Like, for example, the more things a programming language has which are not values, then the less composable it's going to be. The more syntax sugar and, and those types of things it has, then the less composable it's going to be in general. Also, the more constructs the language has, probably the less composable it is, unless all those constructs have some unifying their their unifying denotation, which is itself composable, then probably more constructs equals less composability. And lots of language languages conflate different things. Um, and I do think that these uh, impose significant pains on our day-to-day -day programming. But I think e even more than that, uh, languages just are not designed for themselves building composable and orthogonal APIs. They're not designed to make doing that very easy because they're not, in general, they're not designed around so-called language-oriented programming. 
they haven't addressed a lot of the pain points that arise when you try to take a general purpose programming language that was designed for sorting numbers and calling system processes and doing all that other stuff and build bring a much more declarative modular functional style API to it. And I think that's caused even a bigger source of pain than the limitations of the programming language. But uh, I, I deal with the pain of programming languages all the time. The, the fact that they, they, they aren't in many cases composable, they aren't orthogonal, causes great personal pain. And you have to try to work around these things in, in the APIs that you're building with. In many cases, it's very painful. You have to make trade-offs. You have to compromise the integrity of your API because of the limitations of the programming language. The, the domain. Yeah, machine level is the wrong language. I think you have to go down to some level that has well-defined semantic meaning that, that permits you to make deductions based on that, that that ripple up the system and that allow you to measure the orthogonality of things above that. I don't think we have the tools to doing that. In fact, uh, machine level is the wrong word because if you go down to that level, then you've lost all meaning and everything becomes, like you said, memory and bits and this and that. And how are you going to measure anything at that level? Yeah, so the, the observation is that um, mathematicians have kind of been doing this for a really long time. They've been trying to describe, basically trying to describe um, properties of different domains of mathematics in terms of other things. And category theory has been a really remarkable breakthrough because it's been almost infectious in how it's allowed mathematicians to describe it and give a formal basis to so many different areas in mathematics that were previously unconnected or pseudo-connected or poorly connected through lots of, lots of extensive, not very sound, uh, set theoretic foundations. So I think category theory is very, very promising, and I don't think it's coincidence that many of the abstractions we use in functional programming have their roots in category theory. I also think that programming language designers have not yet made a programming language that does category theory justice. It's extraordinarily painful to work in category theory abstractions that are anything resembling the mathematical versions of them in today's programming languages. They just, people aren't designing languages for that problem. And if they did, then maybe even more of category would be accessible to us programmers but as it is, we have to settle for a little like scraps from the plate with category theory that we hack into our, our programming languages designed for solving totally different problems in totally different ways. So, so guiding principles would be a look at the operation itself and look at what you need to supply to the operation. If you have to supply, the more things you have to supply to the operation, the less likely it is that it's orthogonal. So generally, it's, it's kind of hard to go wrong with an operation that takes one thing and returns one thing. Um, or a, a composable operation that takes two things and returns one of the same kind, it's, it's kind of hard to go wrong. But as you start accepting bits of information 
that dictate your your tampering with the mechanism of composition, then you, you start to, it, it's more of a design smell, I would say, that you may be approaching something which is not orthogonal. The other technique I would suggest is to try to decompose it in other ways. So you have an operation, see if, I know this is proof by imagination, but see if you can come up with other ways to implement that operation. Like just pretend you're, you have a blank slate. If I have a blank slate, what are the, are there any other ways I can take to implement this operation? If, if the answer is yes, then that's also a design smell. And if you can't think of anything, then that doesn't necessarily mean that it's orthogonal. It, it means you, you could be tired and <laughs> not, not thinking creatively that day. But it, it's at least a, 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 s a sign that you maybe you are on the right track. If, if it's accepting few things and if, it's, if you can't think of a way to factor it in terms of any other possible set of operations, then there's a sign that it's, it's just doing one thing. No, it's not that. It, this one has, if you search for uh, Chan, actually maybe it's an ML library, um, Chan and Job and maybe Task. I can almost picture the name in my mind, but I'm sorry, I'm too tired to remember it. Yeah. Yeah, so question was, the orthogonal principle reminds us of single responsibility principle. I spent probably 10 years as a object-oriented programmer, and I was quite enamored of gang of four design patterns and OO best practices and all that. And I did work on some large Java code bases, and I can see where the principles developed in object-oriented design programming, the best practices, they really do help improve code bases. They help people deal with the complexity of large-scale OO. And I think that one of the things that you can do if you have an OO background is spend some time looking at these OO design principles and find their analog in FP. Because no problem, is, no problem under the sun is truly unique. And the problems that arise in object-oriented programming arise, I mean, not all of, all, not all of them arise in functional programming, but usually the problems in OO are the result of tension between being pulled in different dimensions. And when you go over into FP, you can find corresponding problems, tensions be from being pulled in different dimensions. They approach these solutions in different ways, but there are a lot of similarities. And uh, example would be in OO, you code to the interface, not the implementation. And in FP, you use abstractions, which define structure across data types that permit a certain set of lawful operations. And in OO, you have single responsibility principle, which says every object should do have a single responsibility. And then in FP, you have the operations in your API should be orthogonal and so forth. So you can, you can go back and forth, and almost every single best practice in OO has some sort of analog or parallel in the world of FP, and it's really interesting to see the connections. I think nature cares about <laughs> composability. Yeah, does nature care about composability or orthogonality? So, so I think that, I think that <laughs> things are in insanely composable, not entirely, but insanely composable. Because obviously everything is composed from molecules, which is composed from atoms, which is composed from this, and so on and so forth. Our bodies are composed of cells, and, and there's, there's a lot of composability in systems. Maybe not in the same way it's mathematical, but orthogonality is one thing that biological systems do not care about at all. <laughs> they they copy DNA and they make random modifications and one thing ends up 
becoming used for lots of different things. So one gene ends up becoming 10 that each have different purposes. And like our immune system and repair systems are connected. But Right, I'll see you all uh, downstairs. Thanks for coming.